Hey everyone, welcome to Manny's Mic Locker. This is the first episode. I'm Manny. This is my studio, Suplex Audio. I'm here with some of my friends. Let me introduce Myberg M1, MyLab VIP60, Mojave MA37, Vanguard V44S. These are all mics that I use and have been using some of these for close to two years. So I thought the first episode, at least I should show mics that are tried and true. I use them. If you see the mics on the show, it means I really do love them. I've been recording for about 25 years. I'm a producer in Los Angeles, just assuming you don't know. And I work with a lot of strange and weird bands. So microphones have been my gateway to be almost affordability of recording really interesting records, which means I spend a lot of time buying weird guitars, weird pedals, weird amps. The microphones then fit in that category because I can get mics to enhance or degrade sounds, you know, to make, I have some mics that are kind of beat up and they're real beaters. And I may put those on a, on a really clean, boring amp and suddenly it sounds interesting. Speaking of that, I do have some dynamics as well. And the reason I want to showcase is because I feel like mics also are psychological. For instance, this is an AKG 60s D224E, very, you know, all over the Beatles videos. And this is definitely, you know, very, very Ringo Starr drum kit stuff. These are great for acoustic guitar as well. I love this mic. It's one of my favorite hi-hat mics, but come to find out, this is the Mick Jagger mic on Sympathy for the Devil. So when I have a vocalist come in and they're a little tense, I put this on the table and go, okay, here's your Mick Jagger mic for Sympathy for the Devil. Then I can grab another dynamic. This is an AKG D1000. This is the David Bowie handheld from Ziggy Stardust. And if you can see some pictures of him, this is what he's singing out of. So now I got the Mick Jagger. Now I got the David Bowie. And then if you're a little kind of like fancy pants, I got my Frankie. This is a Frank Sinatra D24. The true story to this one, its internals are D19, which is Ringo Starr's overhead. It's half the price. It's got a little bulb. You'll get a, you'll get in a fist fight if someone says that these sound just like the D19s. They don't or whatever. I don't even care. This is one of the greatest vocal mics I've ever had. And if Frankie can use it, then you can use it. So I have these mics. I put them in front of the vocalist and I let them pick whatever mic they want. And that's fun. So I've gotten to the point now where I can grab certain mics to give me certain emotions out of the artist. And sometimes like for instance, the Myberg, it just gets you there. It sounds just incredible. So we'll speak about those later in Manny's Mic Gallery. First off, we're going to be going to Dweezil Zappa. Uh, Dweezil Zappa has a wonderful studio in Los Angeles. It is next level, world class, no lie, 12 feet high stacks of gear. But we're specifically going to his mic locker. I want to talk to Dweezil. He has a great selection of mics. And I want to find out what his theories are on some of these and why he uses them. Then we'll be going to Analogger in Los Angeles as well. Analogger kind of wears some different hats. It's not really a studio. It's not a studio, actually. Um, you could say it's an auction house or a vintage dealer. But they do they predominantly deal in um, memorabilia. For instance, they have like Radiohead's drum set. They got like Randy Rhodes V prototype. They got six Eddie Van Halen guitars. They got an Eric Clapton guitar. I mean, they have Pink Floyd's Benson Ecorex. They got everything there that's really super cool. Um, but we're going there because he's got a handful of mics that I think are important, that are really the mics that were used by these artists. And considering that Thomas has a lot of influence on my life because I worked with him two years ago and that got me into even owning one of these D24s because he had one. I'd never seen one in my life. I didn't even know what it did, how it sounded. And after I got to use it with him, I had to go out and buy two. So I have a lot of respect for Thomas. Hopefully you enjoy it and then stick around to the very end because as we talk about old dynamics and some vintage stuff, I do have a friend, Cole, Cole out of Nashville, that he helps me to repair and clean some of these older mics. And I think it's really important that if I'm going to give you some information on some old mics, you definitely got to have a guy that can fix them for you. All right, let's get straight to it. I'm going to Dweezels, Thomas Griffin, Manny's Mic Locker. I'm supposed to be doing this with Manny, but uh, he's not here. I'm Dweezil Zappa, and this is Manny's mic locker. Well, it's it's going to be my mic locker, but Manny is supposed to be here. I don't know. Let's just get started. All right, so I'm going to open up the mic locker, and you see I've got all kinds of things in here, but what's cool is this keeps everything organized, but then if I want to, I can just open this right up, 
And behind there, there's a bunch of other shelves with other mics. Oh, hey, Manny. Oh, hey, what's up? Is that where you were? You were just hiding back there? You know, I, it is called Manny's Mic Locker. So I actually came in here last <laughs> night, snuck in here. I didn't know if Dweezil was going to show up, so I just stayed the night in there. It was really nice. It was really wonderful. <laughs> Sorry. Super comfy, right? All right. All right. Thanks, man. This is really the mic locker, and it has this swiveling uh, divider, and it's all sort of uh, labeled up, and we can reach in and we can grab mics out. And every mic is using the Triad Orbit little guy that just kind of sticks right in there. So these all clip on real fast, and all the Mics that we use in the studio are really easily accessible and very quick to stick in because of that triad mm -hmm. orbit thing. Super smart. Well, what's good about this is it's like little cubbies for the things that you need the most mm -hmm. or just quick grab microphones. And sometimes there's a couple of weird things in there. Like this is that little halo mic. It I've used it for a lot of different things. It's pretty good on guitars. Mm -hmm. I've used it for oddball drum miking. Um, it's kind of got a notchy, mid-rangey sound. Mm -hmm. Looking at it, it puts you in a different space. Does it have multiple uh, mic patterns or no? This one doesn't, mm -hmm. but it's it's just one of those kind of vibey things. Totally. That, uh, looks old school. It's kind of fun to have. Everything is kind of the standard workhorse mm -hmm. stuff. You know, you got 441s and things. These... My dad used to use these as vocal mics on stage. And this was also Stevie Nicks' vocal mic. You've, yeah. you've seen her in some of the videos like her of course, and Tom Petty. Everybody would usually say, oh, the Stevie Nicks mic. Yeah. And or the Zappa mic, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, my dad had them uh, for, for years on stage as vocal mics. And they were actually really good for like the crotch mic for a drum kit, just like sneaking it in nice. over the drum, over the kick drum towards mm -hmm. the snare. This one, I feel like uh, you can get some pretty cool sounds out of. So to most that would maybe not know, this is a dynamic, even though it looks crazy. It uh, was known for in the 70s. You know, any classic studio in the 70s and 80s, and even now you'll still find them in world-class studios. It's one of the greatest dynamics, you know, technically. Yeah. It really does have a cool sound that's different than some of the other dynamic mics that are pretty standard, you know, this is just another flavor of that kind of stuff. In the other areas of the studio or, or of the mic locker, mm -hmm. this is pretty much filled with cases for stuff, although there are a few other oddball things in here. There's like a Mesonovic stereo ribbon mic in here, mm -hmm. a few other odds and ends. There's some uh, other AEA stereo I love mics. the AEA R88. Is that out here or no? Yeah, that's on a stand yeah. over by I the love, drum That's kit. one of the greatest stereo ribbon mics on earth. I, I, it I really feel. sounds good. And there's a a different version in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. It's the other, it's the 44s. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, it's two, uh, uh, they're called N8s. Yeah, the, uh, the N8, but they, you can put two of them together and make them stereo mm -hmm. and you can change mm -hmm. the pattern, but there's a stereo bar up there. I personally have seen a lot of studios. I don't remember one that has such a wicked mic locker and it's totally custom right yeah the amount of space that you have and try to use it the best you can for storage studios mm -hmm. almost always have way less storage yeah. than they need and this was just a way to have easy access to things that you want all the time and then have more stuff like the back, here. back there yeah, yeah yeah there's some you know like the elvis style 44 mm -hmm. and a few other cool things back there but there's like i said the the ease of use Mm -hmm. And then you close it up and you're good. And uh, one thing, I don't know if you can tell, there is a design in here. Can you share us uh, the oh, origin? Well, it's sort of a, a, a nod to the Van Halen uh, geometric stripes. It's a modern look anyway. Uh, so I like that it's also a nod to Edward. But some of the mics that we have available to look at that are weirdos, mm -hmm. This one is the ray gun, and it's Look like... Uh, oh, my God, it's so cool. Yeah, this is the 642 EV, and yeah. yeah um, I mean, it looks like, it literally looks like a ray gun. You could, you know, what's up? Watch out. Yeah. You know, you never put a mic at someone unless they're recording, but... Uh, <laughs> You can look at that. The thing is amazing. And it's considered maybe a shotgun? Yeah. So this was used in the 50s mm -hmm. as a, 
a way to record dialogue on movie sets. Mm -hmm. We've got one that's very similar to this, but it's bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, here it comes. <laughs> What? Yes. Oh my God. So this one is definitely what they would have used on the bigger sets and you can get that parabolic kind of thing where you point it at something uh -huh. and it picks up what you want from an enclosed space. Look at this thing. This thing yeah. is almost, I mean, this is like, I don't even know, that is crazy looking. Yeah, it's another ray gun looking thing. Now, I've seen pictures of this mm -hmm. used in a early Led Zeppelin session where it was just over the drum kit and there was only one other mic on the kit. Oh my God. The thing about having access to things that make odd or different noises is it gives you a, a different way to start the foundation of a sound. So like instead of starting with all the typical stuff, just move this into place yeah. and listen to it and then say, all right, this sounds good, now what do I need to work in around that sound? And that's one of the things that I like to do with microphones in general is kind of work backwards from a flavor perspective. Yeah. You know, if you're looking that. for something different, try something you wouldn't normally do and then build around it. I love that. And also, one thing you will need when you get this mic is a stand that is worthy to hold it. As you can tell, this boom goes up across about two feet. So we'll, once again, we're always talking about mics and things to put on. This is definitely something you're not going to put on a boom stand unless it's like an Atlas or something from the, yeah. you know, I mean, they sell them now. You can go to a guitar center and get a really cool stand. Yeah, but. this one happens to have come from Sun Studios. Oh, wow. So uh, maybe Elvis actually sang on a mic dangling from this stand. I love it. Anything in this little area you want yeah, to Yeah, I've got over? some other stuff like this little treasure box from Scope Labs, they make these really strange periscope mics. Look at that, look and at it, that. It's like, you know. Can I grab one? Yeah, sure. Just don't drop it, Manny. <laughs> wow, look so at this. These have built-in compression and distortion. The thing about them is, this is again one of those things where without listening to any other mic, yeah. put this on something and then decide how close or how far because that's going to affect how the compression or the distortion will react to the signal. Yeah. So you could use this on a piano, you could mm -hmm. use it on a guitar, it sounds great on drums. Use it musically, you just want to make your ears go, yeah. I like that. You know. But the thing is, there's nothing to uh, adjust, adjust the compression or the distortion on here. It's sound pressure. Yeah, so you have to just choose wisely where you put it. And mm -hmm. it gets super crunchy. But you can do cool things with these mics. Uh, they look cool too, you know, so I mean, it's like, you want one of these. I think you do want one of these. <laughs> I want one of these. Yeah. And now, this is probably one of the coolest mics that I have in here. The Holy Grail. Yeah. Look at this thing. I wonder where I got this. Um, hmm. I wonder where you got yeah, this from. This, this mic right here, this is a very good specimen. It's a very nice, nicely maintained microphone. It's the Altec Coke bottle mic. Wow. Now... This one actually came from Manny. He had this and he brought it over and then he didn't leave with it. We tried it in all different places. So you could use it standing up, you could speak into it, you could point it at stuff. But the thing is, as a crotch mic, again, that going over the shell of the kick drum, pointing at the snare, this thing on this 26 inch kick drum did the coolest thing. It got the beater side and the other side where you have all of that air moving. It got the attack from the, the beater side and all of the low end from the other side. And I don't know exactly how this thing is built, but I've never heard a mic capture both sides in one and right. make it have the exact personality of that kick drum. I was hip to these mics in 1998 or 97. I recorded with Steve Albini in Chicago. He recorded my band, and actually that that's what influenced me to record. And eventually, about a year later, I hit up Steve to ask him if I could learn how to record from him. So that's how I met Steve. But in doing that, I was definitely turned on to this microphone. And they come with different capsules. This is a 21B as in boy, and there's a 21D as in David, and that's a different capsule. I don't know if you can tell, but let's see, that one's uh, flat on top. There's no holes. But there is a slot there, and I have a feeling this is, you can either speak like this or like this, but the 
they're all omnis, but the way the sound enters the capsule absolutely has everything to do with the sound. Now, a 21D um, has holes on the top, so obviously the sound pressure comes in the front. These, the sound comes in from the side. When I had these, I think this is why when he brought it over the kit, you're kind of getting this sound pressure that's coming up through these tiny little vents there, and that may be how you're getting the front and the back and the omni, but it's really it's kind of exaggerated or emphasized that the, the, the kick sound. I love those mics, yeah. some of the greatest mics on earth, you know? We tried it in every weird place, like even directly on the floor, a few feet away from the drum kit, yeah. which I believe is the Steve Albini trick, maybe. It is a great sounding microphone, and it could be just very much the core of a drum sound, and you just add a little to it afterwards. Yeah, you know? I love it, love it. Because if you think about the drum kit as an instrument of itself, mm -hmm. Instead of all the separate parts that you have to have very specifically isolated, mm -hmm. the old way that drums were recorded was just one mic in a room. Yeah. And it was whatever was closest was the loudest thing in the room. And you had to move things around and, and kind of mix based on proximity. Absolutely. But the sound of a drum kit all by itself, like where a good player is playing, mm -hmm. if you get a great sound with just one mic, you're going to have a personality to the recording that makes it more timeless. I, even in my own studio environment, haven't, didn't really mess around with all the different places for that. So when Dweezil came, of course, Dweezil's got the mind of, hey, let's put it on the back of a pickup and drive it by your house. You know, like, so we went around the drum set and he just met everywhere. He put that mic in his mind where he thought this, I wonder if this is cool. It sounded cool, like uh, like I said, a crotch mic um, up above. And that's the beauty of, you know, when I talk about Manny's mic lock, it's about getting mics and learning what they do that you can make recordings. And you don't use it because, like, I know we're saying that's a cool mic, and it is, it is expensive because it's a tube mic. But if you're going to spend the money and you want to buy something really cool, an Altec Coke bottle is probably a great investment if you're going to buy your first vintage mic. Yeah. And it's really useful. All right, Dweezils, what do we got here? Well, we have a bag that is for a weapon. This is the MA-37 from Mojave. And the hat matches. Oh, yes, it does. It does match very well. Now, this particular microphone is, it's a great version of an older Sony mic. It's yeah. based on... C-37. The C-37. So, but this... I have four of these in yeah. here. And so, so, so the thing about it is... This microphone is so good with anything of any volume level, and you can use it for room sounds, guitar sounds, mm -hmm. drum sounds, but it's amazing when you use multiples on a drum kit. Yeah. Well, the toms mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular really sound amazing. God, with these. Yeah. Uh, kick, snare, tom. This. What's great is it, it, it just sort of, again, it rejects the symbols mm -hmm. in a way that make it really pleasing where you're just hearing the drum aspect, yeah. all of the, the heavy duty stuff that you want to hear from a drum kit. It's like the heavy lifting of the mic is done. Yeah, this does it. And again, without any EQ. Well, you know, for, for some of you that would even see what I've done, I have done a few uh, Pro Sucker Pros featuring this mic. And one of the reasons this mic really shocked me as we were talking about the Coke bottle, I have symbolically maybe, you know, Dweezil got my Coke bottle because I've actually fallen in love with this one. Yeah. And I love the fact on drums, it doesn't have a lot of cymbals in it. But the coolest thing about this is there's little holes all inside so the tube breathes to the body. And there's a lot of things in the design that I thought were really cool. Now, when you have the subject of vintage mics, I just, like even the Altec, I had to get it recapped and redone. So whenever you buy a vintage mic, don't fool yourself that you're not going to send it to a tech and spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars to have cables and stuff redone. The Mojave, the coolest thing about this is brand new. It's under warranty. Uh, they make these right now, and they'll service them, and they're just beautifully crafted mics. I mean, for sure. I'm not paid to do that, but I'll say that it's one of my favorite new mics on the market for sure. Yeah, there's nothing bad that can happen when you have that microphone nothing in front of a sound all. source. Nothing at all. I know I'm doing this mic locker thing where I'm really focusing on the mic locker. Really quick, tell us about uh, this studio and in a quick summary of 
where it came from, how it came from, and actually what are you looking to do at your studio? Well, it's a studio that is really about exploring sound. Uh, so there's interesting mic choices, but there's also interesting ways to implement them. I have mics in the ceiling. I have them in the hallway. Mm -hmm. I have them uh, already kind of hooked to the wall. There's these triad orbit um, bases that you yeah. can... Um, hook up to the wall and just stick things I've in. I've seen them around. That's a, yeah. that's a microphone stand company that they they can actually hold like seven mics on one stand. You can do that, but you can also uh, have other uh, places. Accessories. Let's say you have a small space and you don't want to stand in there. You can actually put it in the ceiling mm -hmm. or you can put it on the sidewall and you can have boom arms that attach. I love that. And it's just a real quick setup for that. So but the idea behind the studio was to be able to record music, new music, but also your music, well, mine or working as a producer with other people mm -hmm. um, and also be able to do live productions that could be broadcast from the studio. We can do video. We mm -hmm. can do audio. Uh, I can mix in Atmos. Love so it. it's it's a pretty heavy duty setup, but it, it wasn't always going to be that. It just became that became more that. when uh, COVID changed so many things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I used to tour six months out of the year for wow. almost 15 years straight. Wow. And then I haven't been touring because the industry got basically wiped absolutely, out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me here. I, I'm a huge fan of Dweezil and not only on his. You know, I've come to get to know him as a uh, producer and an engineer and kind of a, a guy that's really, you can spend about two hours hearing his philosophy on recording and really it would, it's mind blowing. So the fact that I get to know you and if you don't know, he's one of the most incredible guitar players on earth and we get to sit around and I get to learn Van Halen solos from him. So I think we're going to get into eruption right now. So we got to get going. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. thank you for checking it out and um, stay tuned for some more. Mic lockers. All right. See ya. Right now we're at part of the show, Manny's Mike Gallery, and let's get straight to it. M1. What are you saying, M1? M1's made in Germany. It's high quality, probably a full piece of brass that's been milled out, um, weighs a ton. I have it on one of my most sturdy mic stands, size of a human arm, and it has this really cool, I don't, I don't know if you can tell, but it's got this really wonderful adjustment that lets it go forward or back. And this isn't one of those mics that's going to start moving around. It's really rock solid, made incredibly well. Rock solid power supply that comes with it that lets you go uh, run the garden of Omni to figure eight and then anywhere in between. This mic has a wonderful 3D image of sound sources. Yes, I know it looks vintage, but it doesn't sound like a C12. It doesn't sound like a 67. It's going to leave you a little bit baffled on what this mic sounds like. But what it sounds like is... A face. If you put a face in front of this mic, it sounds like a face. Female, male, you know, it doesn't matter. This mic captures that, and I can speak on the highest level of my admiration and love for a mic. This mic fulfills that. I've used it for bass, drums, guitars, vocals, violins, and every time I use it, I just go, oh my God, I'm so grateful to be able to have made a record with this. Speaking of that, I had done a record where I was using this as a mono overhead. Most of the times I have this as a mono overhead. I think it was four or five songs into it. For whatever reason, we had to reset up. And that morning, I just, in the rush, didn't put up the Myberg, and I thought I'd be fine. As soon as the band tracked and like, oh my God, that's the take. And then I played it back. 
oh my God, did I have that regretted feeling of like, oh my God, it's not going to sound the same like the other songs. It was my reminder of how great this mic was because that 3D image of the previous song, I could not get it out of, I think I used a dynamic, a single dynamic. And I know they're different things and it did work. It sounded cool. It sounded like an Elvis Costello record, but the Myberg is a winner. It's less than a fancy Neumann. You're definitely going to have to save some pennies to buy it, but I think if there's a Desert Island mic, or if you're going to buy one old, older style or looking to mic that you want to fulfill your dreams of recording, the M1 100% has f- fulfilled mine. And I do appreciate Andrew letting us try this out, and I've had it for about a year and a half, and I love it. So that's the Myberg M1. On to the next one. Mic number two of Manny's Mic Gallery. This is a Mojave MA37. It's a tube condenser. Tube in the top of the mic or the bottom because you flip it either way. Hardcore power supply built like a tank. Has this cool big handle over here for a caveman like me to carry around. But I truly think its purpose is to protect the five pin mic cable that plugs in here that powers the microphone in the tube. That runs all the way around to the top. And you plug it here. And it's about a foot away from the mic, and basically you can take it off the stand. What I love about that is it is actually built like the, the way the real Sonys were. And I do think because of that mic cable being a foot away where you, where you make the impact, super smart not to put it anywhere on the mic. And I do think when you get an expensive mic like Neumann's and any mic over four, five, six thousand dollars, they always have the screw on bottom and you're never slamming a cable into it. But, you know, dynamics and ribbons and you know, some condensers, even 87, you just plug the mic in the bottom. But I love that this one doesn't have that. It's definitely in the spirit of the real Sony C37. In the back of it, there's a small portal that you put a Mojave screwdriver or any small screwdriver, make sure it fits. It seems sacrilegious to be putting a, a screwdriver to the back of the capsule, but it's made this way. It's true to Sony's and there's a C and then an Omni little symbol. And you can go from cardio to Omni. I use that all the time. Super useful for doing drums in Omni. Or if I use it as an overhead, sometimes I put it in cardioid. Uh, for guitars and bass, you can just, you know, any way you want it. For vocals, I'll definitely put in cardioid. But this mic is a Desert Island mic. I've used it for about a year and a half on some shows on Produce Like a Pro if you want to go backwards in time. Um, I did a Hunt Sales episode where we cut one song. I use this on his lead vocals. I use it on his guitars, on the bass, on the drums. Even though in some of it on the drums were in conjunctions with other microphones, I leaned in this microphone because I really love it. It reminds me of my Alltech 150s, which are a 1950s tube mic. This is the closest thing I've ever found that gives me that feeling of my Alltech. So I think they got it right on that. The Sony's, the original ones, I had a pair, and I eventually sold them years ago. Uh, I know they were vintage. They were worth a lot. I really got them because Van Halen had them as their overheads, and, you know, you want the Van Halen overheads. But... In all the vintage blah, 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 they were really left me feeling disappointed. It wasn't really, for me, worth the money for those. And they were just sitting real estate in my locker. And if I'm not using it, I just don't have the mic. So I got rid of them, kind of forgot about them. And it wasn't until Warren was doing an episode using Mojave mics. And I saw the ad for one of these. I asked him, is it possible to borrow the MA37? And then Mojave, a little later, was nice enough to sell one over, which I've had for about a year and a half. And I will say, it's a desert island mic. I love this microphone. I use it every day, and it has a huge impact on my recordings. 
Mojave, I think you got it right. MA37, time to go to mic number three. Mic number three from Manny's Mic Gallery is a Vanguard V44S. Obviously, this mic is as tall as the Eiffel Tower or taller than me, <laughs> but it's beautiful, has these wonderful brass capsules. Uh, the mic is stunning, not only in its look, but sonically inside. Whatever they did, they did it right. Comes with this wonderful shock mount. It's just sturdy, works well. And this is a condenser, not a tube microphone, so there is no power supply needed, but it does come with this magic black box back here. The mic comes in on one cable, and obviously there's a lot of information. You have two capsules and electronics coming through here, runs on phantom power, but the breakout box is where the magic happens. You have three outs here that are XLRs that go to your DAW, or your recording system, or your tape machines. One is the bottom, one is the top, and then you have a duplicate of the top on the third one that's flipped out of phase. And that's for MS recording. So it's a decoder. So it runs three to your DAW, your recording system, and it's already giving you MS. Well, actually, if you turn that mic like that, that would be MS recording. So that's one thing that I was excited about this microphone. But Derek, the owner, uh, when he sent this over, he'd give me a little tip. He said people that they had been using this with different preamps each mic. I didn't even think about that. But then once he told me a different preamp for the top and the bottom, my brain lit up. First thing I did was put it on a Marshall cabinet. Top was a Neve, bottom was an API. Uh, the Neve was kind of the center. The API was on the edge of the cone. I committed to it and it sounded awesome. And I was already like, okay, this mic has already won me over. It's gotta be here. I've gotta talk about it. So that was for guitars. And the coolest thing also is if you change this, you know, you can run this one. Let's say you have a vocalist, male or female, um, and they're singing in the top. You can press the top and then the, the uh, I'm sorry, the bottom. They're singing to this one, but the top one, you can run it to some reverbs or some delays or some tape delays or even some guitar pedals. And you're going to get this wild sound left to right. So I believe there's a really massive amount of just options you can have for this mic that are all musical and really cool. Hold one second. Uh, Daddy needs his glasses. All right, so each capsule has its own polarity switch in the back. So you have a set for the bottom, set for the top. It looks like um, if you put the switch to the left, you get Omni. Center is figure eight. To the right is cardioid. So that being said, you have another set of tools to use. For instance, you can put... You know, faces both forward, maybe the top is omni, bottom's cardioid. You can make them both figure eight, turn it slightly, and then turn the mic around, and now you have a wonderful gang vocal room mic or, or in front of the drums. I had them, I actually tested them always, but when I faced them all forward on the drum set, I just loved it. It was just this huge drum sound, flat, the cymbals were appropriate, drums were loud, second tier was the cymbals. They just did it right. I mean, I'm not sure all the technology that went into this mic but it is of all the mics i've shown the most affordable it is under 1200 bucks maybe even 1100 or a thousand don't kill me but i think they're on sale it's brand new you can buy it right now wonderful shock mount beautifully made a plethora of options on this mic that is just a wonderful two box and it's here because I love it and I wanted to share it with you. So anyways, mic number three is a winner, totally inspiring microphone, and I can't wait to use it on more sessions and really get more creative with it. Vanguard, you did it. The V44S is a stealthy, super cool microphone. Mic number four coming up.
saving the best for last. This is mic number four of Manny's Mic Gallery, My Lab VIP 60. This mic is a Swedish mic, Swedish technology. They're a household name in Sweden and in Europe, and in the United States, you may not have heard of My Lab, but I will tell you, you heard of Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson. That's the mic they used. So it is sitting in world-class studios all over the world. I'm personally just late to the game. When I saw this mic at NAMM, I was like, it's a Darth Vader mic. It's a Death Star mic. I have no idea except it looked like something out of Star Wars. And as I came to find out more about the mic, I just realized through speaking with my lab, if there's any way to try this mic out. And they were nice enough to send it out. I only got it a week ago. So of all the mics I've showcased, this is the newest one of them all. I've used it on tambourine, like I mentioned. I use it on guitars and I've used it on vocals. All of them outstanding. The guitar was like the speaker, flat response. I used it next to a 409. And between those two, I really love it. This is a condenser. You don't need a power supply. It's not two, but you do need phantom power. It's laid out pretty simple on the front. Five patterns you can have. Looks like figure eight, super cardioid, cardioid, and somewhere in between omni and then omni. Below it is a roll-off switch. There's flat, 200 hertz, and then 500. And then below that is a pad, 0, 10, and 20. Pretty simple. Now, from what they've explained to me about the rectangular capsule and the technology behind it, it's all about the real estate of that capsule. That technically, if that was in a lollipop, it would be huge. So you'd have a large lollipop on top. Because this is rectangular, they're able to get more real estate out of the capsule. And that is their design. All their mics have, at least what I've seen, rectangular capsules. Ulf, who's a dear friend, has a studio in Sweden. He has some other pencil uh condensers that have the same kind of capsules in them. He just cannot stop talking about how great my lab is for drums. I think he uses them for toms and they have overheads. Um, they have a sister company, I believe it's called Pearl. I may get that wrong, but I did see that company and they have a new flagship large tube mic that came out. Same technology, same rectangular capsule. I'm going to say that this mic sounds the most unique of all the mics I've ever used. I can't wait to use it more. On the next Manny uh, Mic Locker 2 or 3, I'm going to give you an update. And Dweezil, I'm coming over to the try this mic out on drums. I love this mic. It is super innovative, super inspiring. And once again, if you see it here on Manny's Mic Locker, definitely worthy to check out. Even though Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson used it, Manny from Los Angeles used it. So anyways... Thanks for checking this out. On to the next. Alright everyone, I'm here on one of the first episodes of Manny's Mic Locker. I'm in with my good friend Thomas Scriven. Hello. Uh, Thomas has a wonderful company called Analogger. They have probably in California, in Los Angeles, maybe the world, one of the greatest collections of memorabilia from guitars, mics, pictures, drum sets. We're talking Beatles, Grateful Dead, and just to fast forward and leapfrog all that, today we're really going to be talking about their microphone collection, which is outstanding. Not only is it like the vintage mics that you would love to have, but the ones that like, I'll let Thomas tell you the rest. But off the top of your head, what are you excited to have in your analogger catalog? Oh, okay. So I am a big fan of anything Pink Floyd. So I would say that if we were going to start this off, we would start it off with our Britannia Row. Uh, microphone collection. All right, here we are at the mic table at Analogger. Thomas, let me know what you got here. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to leave most of the power supplies out of this okay. the cabling. So this is a C28. This is property of Britannia Row. 
So this was used a lot in the studio, and it's pretty well documented as being the drum overheads for Pink Floyd's recordings. I got these from a gentleman named Jamie Lane, who is the director for Brit Row. And when they sold gear, I believe it was in maybe the early 2000s, they had sold off Brit Row, the studio, because it became apartments. The microphones that didn't sell during that time that Jamie had held on to are the ones that I ended up purchasing. Awesome. So I have this C28, one of your favorite microphones, which is the D224E. Love it. Same thing, property of Britannia Row. Bastards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the kick drum, which is f- super exciting, the D112. Oh, my God. Property of Britannia Row. This microphone, which is a D202. Mm-hmm which you see Pink Floyd recording a lot with these and doing live performances, yeah. vocal mics. This is interesting, too, because this, this mesh here, mm-hmm. this is like, it's almost like a styrofoam piece of metal. Yeah. And when Eric Consol was making his undertone audio console um, and he wanted to try to figure out how to get the reflection, yeah. uh, the, bo- the sound bounce off of the, you know, the face of the console, this is what they... They turned to this microphone and said, let's, let's use this. Let's find about, out about this material. Mm-hmm. I think this is like some NASA developed metal. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is a very, uh, you know, well documented, uh, microphone from Pink Floyd. Um, and then a couple of things that aren't here right now that we have from that collection is we have an AKG 414 and then we have a pair of, uh, Neumann U87s then those are sequential serial numbers too. And same thing, Britannia Roast. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a big, massive Pink Floyd Mm -hmm. fan. Uh, You can probably see over there, we've got a little shrine. Those are the Britannia Row gobos. And then that is David Gilmore's personally owned EMS uh, AKS Mm -hmm. Synthia. A. Yep. And that was purchased right in the, to coincide with the recording of Dark Side of the Moon and then through the tour that followed after. And that is the Benson Echo Rec from Live at Pompeii, which nice. is, uh, came from Peter Watts, who is, you know, was the road manager mm-hmm. for, for Floyd. So then we have these three Sennheisers. These are the MD-409s. Wow. And also a really beloved microphone for guitar recording and also vocals. So these are all Live at Pompeii mics. Ivan Pompey. So if you watch that video and you see Gilmore singing and everyone just singing into these mics. Yeah, so these, these came from, uh, from Peter Watts, who was the tour manager. Uh, he did live in Pompeii. Naomi Watts' father, if you can believe that. So he passed on very, very early mm-hmm. um, in his life. I forget which album cover it is, but when you open up the album cover and there's like a very well laid out touring rig of, of Pink Floyd where... I believe there's some sort of vehicle and then there's like symmetrical layout on this road of all of their gear. He's the guy that's pictured there. Um, you know, very significant history with, with Pink Floyd. What about these 421s you got here? Okay, so these 421s, this is, this is cool. So we have another studio collection, which is Crystal Sound. That's the home of you know, Stevie Wonder's uh, Songs of the Key of Life. Um, it was Motown West for a while. And there's a, over 100 gold and platinum records that came out of that studio, mm-hmm. which is a little bit south of Santa Monica yeah. here in Los Angeles. It became Barefoot Studios. Okay. Um, Eric Valentine bought it, I think, in like the mid to late eight, uh, 90s and, and then did a bunch of great records there. But we've got uh, the Mic Locker. Um, not completely complete, but we have a lot of the stuff that that didn't pass on to the to the uh, to the new owner. So here's a pair of C thirty seven A's, which are you know maybe some of my favorite mics. Now those are two mics, correct? Yes, ninety eight percent of the microphone is in the power supply. Mm-hmm. I was familiar with these microphones because uh, because of Ross and then Daniel Lenoir. For some part of Frank Sinatra's career, these were his main vocal microphones. Same boy. This one says 20th Century Fox Film Corp. Um, this was from Crystal. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is number two. Uh, we also have number one. Uh, so there's a pair of these. Okay. Um, and same exact thing here with the 77. Crystal Industries 0034. 
Nice. And so there's two of these as well. So this is something that is really, really very special. This is the U47, the Telefunken U47 uh -huh. that Stevie Wonder used on Songs in the Key of Life. And it's really well documented at it says harmonica microphone. Wow. So we also have, you know, the pair of LA2As, which are sequential, some reverbs, and we have 35 complete preamps and EQs from, from the very famous Studio A console. Here's a pair of 47 FETs from Crystal. Mm -hmm. Number one, number two. One thing that I think is really super cool about this U47 is that the power supply is 0001 from Crystal Industries. And then the microphone is 0002. Mm -hmm. Here is a KE3, which is uh, from Michael Beinhorn. Mm -hmm. Michael Beinhorn, amazing producer, produced some of my favorite records. Soundgarden, super unknown. We have his microphone collection. And so this is one of his favorite mics, as well as his 251, mm -hmm. which came from Power Station in New York. This microphone recorded Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA and uh, some Bowie records. Just amazing piece of history here. Some of my favorite from Michael's collection, the RCA BK5A. Mm -hmm. So this, along with the SM57, this is his bass and guitar directly into 1058s, which are over there, yep, those black the modules. Back. This is the guitar tone for Super Unknown. So just, it. just this microphone, a 57, maybe a 56, 56 mm -hmm. or 57 into those modules, that's it, done. Wow. And, you know, growing up, that was one of the most influential records, mm -hmm. you know, from a, from a guitar player's perspective yeah. that I had heard. And here's, here's the, other, the other one. Um, and then, you know, here's what that microphone looks like when it has the windscreen oh, the on. the windscreen on it, yeah, yeah. So another BK5A. So these are the five A's. The five B's look exactly the same, but they're not the same. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I will say for my friends and people that are checking in. I mean, some of these mics you may think that are very elite and they're hard to find and they're very expensive, but you can still go out there and find the AKG T24Es. Yeah. You still can find the Salt Shaker 633As. Um, some of the ribbons you can find in different conditions. The Sonys are still available. Matter of fact, I always rave about a Mojave MA37, which is a copy of the C37. The Sennheiser... Uh, 409s are still available at Guitar Center, but they're 609s and they're 906s, but symbolically of the same family. So it's not, and even the D112 from Pink Floyd is something you can go right now and still buy that same model. So yeah, these are very inexpensive. Yeah, absolutely. Like these are bucks. kind of, you know, these are just working. These are like an SM57 for a absolutely, kick drop. Absolutely. I think they're, you know, you're looking at maybe a hundred. 120 bucks for yep. something like this, and exactly that, like this. This that pink exact one. kick drum, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. This is cool. This is a Decca Record uh, Company Studio 3, another uh, 224E that, that we, Manny and I, are big fans of. Here's sort of the microphone that, that kicked it all off for us. Oh my God, Shoot, it's a beautiful I've got one. At least. I've never seen a blue one like that. I've I've got I have a feeling it's probably because it has been Refamed. reworked, but but maybe not. Um, it comes with the original box and paperwork. Mm -hmm. I literally have I don't know fifteen of these just because I love them. And as a guitar player, I have so many amps, and you know you're always like I want to put one on everything. Yep, I mean I so. love it. I really I I always describe it. It it kind of takes the fog out of a 57 and you get the essence of the speaker and the whole shebang. Also part of Michael Beinhorn's collection are these really cool CMV 51s, which are just the cutest little mics that you've ever seen. And so there's a pair of them. I've never seen another pair. This is sort of how they come. Just, just very, 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 very cool. Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly what Michael loved them. Mm -hmm. On so there's there's CM fifty one use the body is a CMV fifty one nine yeah um, 
these are very low serial numbers. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that since I haven't seen very many, these are both under 200 serial well, numbers. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I've never seen an, you know, I've never seen another mm-hmm. one, let alone a pair. These are classic A and B Neumann M250s, which he used on everything. Wow. Oh you know, my just, God. just lovely, amazing microphones, number 40 and number 54. Um, and from what I understand, I'd have to dig a little bit more into it. But I believe Michael used these as proximity mics in the room to really get the depth and dimension of the drums. This is something that's very, very special. These are the Lomo 19A9s that Steve Albini sold, um, and they're very well documented. These are the microphones that were used on the drum overheads for Nirvana's In Utero, as well as uh, Kurt Cobain's vocal mic. Um, Kurt Cobain was using, I believe, a 421, this, and maybe an Electra voice. Um, RE20. There you go. And so I have the picture of these being used. There's a perce- there's a picture of from the vocal perspective of looking at the lyrics to Rape Me and then the three microphones that were used and blended for, uh, for Kurt's voice. And I don't remember exactly which one it is, but it's very distinctive when you look at the picture, which one of these that is. Yeah. But yeah, these are, you know, amazing microphones. All of the microphones that you would expect to see in a, you know, in a professional recording studio, we have great examples of all of them. We really focus on historic mics that have very great records of the impact that they've made in within the auto community and also, you know, on the commercial side of music. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the things that we're dealing with are, if it's a really amazing microphone with no history, it typically has some sort of 100% original quality or sequential serial numbers, things like that, museum, museum quality microphones. All right, well, before I go, I'm going to turn off this camera because I'm going to try to walk out with the mic here. I don't know which one I'm going to try to steal <laughs> from Thomas, but uh, hopefully it'll be something cool and I'll share with you guys later. Here, just take this one. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's I the one. I know you want it. I do. That's the one I want. So yeah. I'm actually going to get a BK5 from Thomas. We'll work out the price later. Yeah. I may have to go to the analogger site and put down a credit card for that. I would take the windscreen off, though. I would. I, I, I like it without You want to get this thing as close as you possibly can to the... Uh... But I'm serious, Thomas. I'm walking out with that one. Take All it. All right. There it is. It's going in my pocket. <laughs> and I'm, oh, you know what? Uh, yeah. About a month ago, Sylvia Massey came in, mm-hmm. and she has a microphone museum. And so we, had, we have a couple Bob Dylan microphones, which I didn't show you. Mm-hmm. And there was a microphone. She was like, oh, my gosh, I've never seen this microphone before. I was like, well, it came from Bob Dylan. You know, it came from it from Bob's manager we've done some work with. I was just like, you know what? Just take it. Wow. So we gave it to her. Oh, my God. So we're philanthropic, too. There it is. <laughs> if, you can, if you can stop by and catch Thomas on a good day, treat us some breakfast, maybe it'll be like, hey, Thomas, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Manny. All I appreciate right. it. I love you, man. Talk okay, to you soon. Okay, love you, too. Bye. Hey guys, I'm Cole and I own a business called Colpix Vintage where I do repairs on ribbon and dynamic microphones. Manny asked me to come on and give just a quick pitch of my services. So if you need any help with any ribbons or dynamics, I work on a lot of AKG D12s, anything like that, any microphone that you need re-ribboned, I can help you out. Hopefully you enjoyed watching this video of Manny's mic locker. I'm certainly pumped to check out all the videos. And yeah, again, if you need any help with any microphone repairs, I'm here to help. You can go to my website, colpixvintage.com. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching Manny's Mic Locker, episode number one. Thank you, Dweezil Zappa. Thank you, Thomas at Analogger. Thanks, Producer Like a Pro, for having me on this platform. Also, thank you, Myberg, MyLab, Mojave, and Vanguard for letting me showcase their mics on this. Please leave a comment below for any mics that you'd like to see on future episodes. Also, anything you want to say, I'll try to answer your questions. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram, I'm at Suplex Audio, which is my studio and what I do basically for a living. And uh, I have my own microphone company called Original Gravity Wave Microphone Company. I hope to be showcasing one of our ribbon mics here in the upcoming episodes. Lastly, I'm in a band called The Chavez Ravine. I'm 
throwing it all out there. We're just pimping it. Episode number one in the books. I am relieved. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.